Good morning, Mary. Good morning, Ms. Clarissa. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm so excited that you get to be a part of the Oasis show. Um, you are, uh, I always call you my president, but you're the president and CEO of NBCC. And um, I've known you since my very first days here six years ago. Um, yeah. But I, I know, and it seems like yesterday, but then it also, you know, it's, it's six years. But I wanted to bring you on because, you know, in the middle of, you know, this show was started in the middle of, you know, the pandemic. And in the middle of the pandemic, you were tasked with leading, you know, the organization, you know, through some challenging times. And, and I know mm -hmm. each week when I get your weekend or email, you know, e each week there's some challenging times there, but um, as an employee, but also as a mom whose daughter goes to NBCC, I, I just, I'm just so proud and grateful every day that, that this organization has, has done this for not just the employees, but also the students. But can you comment a little bit about your role as the president, just as a new president taking us through this pandemic? Yeah, um, I guess you don't really know what the, the president's role is in, until you're in it, or at least I didn't. Um, and I've, I've run my own business, so I've been the president of, of a company before, but it was very different being the president of a um, publicly funded college. And uh, the first year we had a lot of exceptional circumstances. Um, that we navigated, um, all of which were first first time experiences for for me, for our senior team, and for the college, um, and that was before COVID. Um, and once COVID uh, settled in, and, and we realized we were in a pandemic situation, um, you know, the the initial emergency orders, um, which were outside of our control said the students were not allowed in the buildings. And so the first thing we had to figure out was. Um, and we were, you know, everybody's talking about essential and non-essential. Um, we first had to figure out um, how does one deem themselves essential and uh, what does that mean for us from an operational standpoint? And um, so my role changed a lot. I have to tell you that um, it's one, things were changing very rapidly. So staying on top of what our legal responsibilities were and our public health accountabilities and also just care and, and well, well-being of our staff and our students became vitally important, as was advocacy. Um, so, you know, initially with the support of staff across the college, we moved everything virtually, which no one was prepared for. So staff pulled out all the stops to connect with people. Um, not everyone was equipped with cameras and with Zoom and Teams and all the tools that we're using today and have been using now for months. At the outset, we, we didn't have those things. So it meant create phone calls and text messages and emails and any way we could find to connect with students, connect with staff and make sure people were okay and, and handling things well. And then it became really apparent. And, and I have to share from my own experience, I was a student once who had to sacrifice a lot to go to school. And suffice it to say, I could never have afforded to repeat a semester. And so front of mind for me was, I didn't understand the virus. I didn't understand emergency acts and measures and all that sort of stuff. But I knew for certain that we had made a commitment to our students and that their investment in their post-secondary education had to be honored. And we had to figure out a way to help them either progress in their studies, meaning to complete you know, last year and move on to next year, or to be eligible to graduate. And that meant we had to become advocates. We had to advocate for access to our labs and our clinical placements and our shops um, so that people could meet graduation criteria. So it really changed everything about our operations, everything about what my focus was and what I was required to do to, to sustain the college and, and keep us on a path. And uh, of course, from a business perspective, and I know you know that's that's what Oasis is all about. From a business perspective, we had to start doing scenario planning. What was enrollment going to look like um, in the fall, and what impact did that have on our budget and therefore our operations, and um, how were we going to make those adjustments um, to cause the least amount of disruption as possible? Yeah. So it changed everything and fast, like everyone else experienced. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's a team sport and, and we couldn't have done it without a strong, committed community that valued the same thing, putting students first and honoring our commitments. And, and you and 
I've heard the message from you over and over again in the last you know six months that respond, adapt, and change. And it it that had to come from our students, but it also had to come from the staff as well. And you and I talk a lot about entrepreneurial mindset and entrepreneurial spirit, and we all really had to dig deep. And because so often when you work for an organization or a business, when we walk in, we expect that organization or business to kind of tell us what it is that's going to happen. But it required a lot of us to to really dig deep and find, you know, and and be motivated and and self driven to to be able to help the college along. So you know. When when you kind of come out with the theme of respond, adapt, and change, um, you know how important was it that we all kind of got on the bus at the same time? Oh my gosh, it was critical. We would not have succeeded. We celebrated our largest graduating class in the college's history, and we would not have done that without all hands on deck. And it's funny that you say that because what I loved most is whether it was through social media just observing um, people posting things that they were doing, whether it was students or staff or faculty, um, or people would send me emails and say, hey, I just, I knew you would get excited about this. And, you know, and it was like the first day back in the shop and they've got masks on and, and they've got students in and that sort of thing. But to your point, you know, we needed to, to drive decision-making down to the appropriate level so that people were mobilized instead of being constrained by, um, the, the emergency measures and the public health guidelines, we wanted people to feel empowered. Um, so what we did was we tried to create a shared vision, right? We're about students. We're about transforming lives and communities. We care about student success and getting them across the finish line. And that was our first, you know, we didn't set big five-year target. We said, look, June is right there. We want to get these students either across the finish line or to progress in their studies. And then everyone was empowered to do that. And so it was really exciting. And I think What's key to it, Carissa, to your point is, is sharing that because no one person can do it. And, you know, each of us took turns having a low day and, and high days. And so, you know, sharing those pictures and stories of success, um, I think motivated people and inspired people to keep going. Yeah, it's very true. It's very true. I know, you know, even for me, you know, I had my daughter come home from, you know, yeah. you know, had to come home. And so I gave up my office, my home office to her. And then I was, I literally had a cardboard box that I took my things around every room of the house. Right. And it was like an office in a box, a mobile, a mobile office. Right? And you just had to, you know, you just had to come up with, you know, with ways to do it. But you mentioned that, you know, from a business standpoint and, you know, a lot of our small businesses across the province, you know, face the, these realities and a lot of them had to completely shut down. Um, but I want to take a minute to talk about our response um, to entrepreneurship in the province. Um, you know, it's, it is one of, it is the, in the NBCC advantage and it is important. And, and you and I started this journey six years ago when I came to the college. Um, so if we can pivot for a minute, even though I don't like the word pivot, because we've heard it so much, um, you know, can you kind of, can we talk a little bit about how important, you know, the entrepreneurs in the province are and, and our and our kind of our, our vision of entrepreneurship services at the college? Mm -hmm. Well, you you know um, where my passion comes from. It's uh, my parents were small business owners. I've been a small business owner my whole adult life. And uh, so it's a sweet spot for me and it's close to my heart because I, I believe that small and medium sized businesses in particular, large, the whole business community in its entirety, but the majority of our businesses are micro, small and medium sized businesses. And they're the workhorse of the province and of our nation. And they're so critical to everything that we do. And so it was really sad and scary for me, both as a business owner, but also as a member of the business community and in my role here as someone who provides a lot of the labor force for that business community, it was really scary to see people close and be so uncertain about their futures. And so um, it, it, that's been front and center. We've we paid attention to the employment numbers. We paid attention to the number of businesses um, closed, those who were open, those who were doing well, those who were struggling to stay open and, and still you know, depending on which way things go, we know there are predictions about some businesses that may not make it past the end of the calendar year. So we're, we're not out of the woods. We have seen some recovery, but there are a lot, particularly those 
that um, that have direct customer contact that are still struggling to get back up to uh, pre-COVID levels. So there's no doubt that that businesses have had a, hard, a difficult time. Um, and some of the things that we know from research that was done pre-COVID is that if a business struggles to get the talent that they need, they're 65% more likely to be low growth firms. Mm -hmm. And so we don't want businesses hanging by a thread. We want to make sure that they have the skilled labor force to be successful. And that's hard when you don't know what, how the guidelines and things are going to impact you and change your business. And I know for some, it's been transformational in a positive way. For others, they're still fighting to figure out how to do it. Um, and that's why I think a program like Oasis is so critical because it's not a one size fits all. It's not a cohort based model where you come in and you all learn the same thing and come out the other side. It's very specific to the individual business owner or, or business's problem and they get someone to help them with that. And so this is a critical time for that. Mm -hmm. You know, the, how it's felt and how businesses have to adapt is different across the board. And so that kind of um, in time, personalized, responsive approach that Oasis takes, I think is the absolute best model for what we have going on right now. And for NBCC, we're still focused on the fact that we were predicting 120,000 uh, person vacancy um, in the labor market for New Brunswick and that the large majority of those will require post-secondary education. And we know how important it is and we already have some projects underway to work with those people who were displaced by COVID, um, either their job went away or it's changed or there's all kinds of situations or they were, we know that people in part-time um, work were, were impacted, certain vulnerable populations, racialized people, women, indigenous people were harder hit. So we're looking at how do we help individuals figure out what their learning and experience is and, and, and be able to articulate it in a way that, that employers can recognize it. And then are there short term or even medium term things we can do to help kickstart them and get them back um, into the workforce? The days of job security, you know, I've got a job and I can stay in it forever are over. Um, this has highlighted for us the need for skills security, skills that I can transfer whether I move to a different employer or move to a different job, but those skills are transferable and it may it, it ensures that I'm relevant and I still have a place in the labor market. That's really what we want to see because we want New Brunswick not just to recover, we want to thrive. We yeah. want to grow as a province. Yeah, absolutely. And and it's it, to me it's so important to you know to help the small business owners, but you know to really show them I mean, these skills that we all learned, I mean, there, there might be somebody who's been in, in a job for 30 years and they didn't know how to go home and work from home, but it would, you know, working from home is a skill set. And, you know, these small business owners are now they're, they're able, they were able to, like, I talked to somebody yesterday who's going to be on the show. And she said, you know, I threw up my hands and said, I'm done. Right. I'm done. And she said, so, but I had to like slowly kind of map out a new world for myself. Right. Mm -hmm. And we really have to build in that, that entrepreneurial mindset, especially into our students, because we're sending our students to work for these small business owners and, you know, building in that entrepreneurial mindset will help them understand what that small business owner has to go through in order to grow. Yeah. Well, it's an exciting time for, for small and medium-sized businesses in a different way. You know, Clarissa, um, we had a hard time when we were trying to grow enrollment, we had a hard time, um, always being able to find practicum placements for our students. It, you know, employers love it. We get great feedback from our employers, but it is a lot of work. They're taking on a student. They wanna make sure they're engaged. They wanna make sure the learning is meaningful and that they can provide the appropriate feedback to instructors and that sort of stuff. So there's a lot of work that goes into that. And when, um, when the, the shutdown happened and we had that economic downturn, a lot of employers said, I'd love to help you out, but right now I'm just trying to keep the lights on. Um, and so our instructors, they're very creative. And so they were able to come up with simulations and things like that. But one of the things that they're looking at now is we want, again, we're trying to, to minimize disruption to students and staff. So yes, students are going to campus for the applied learning components, but they're also doing connected classrooms and virtual learning with um, led by instructors. Mm -hmm. um, so we're looking for employers who have problems they wanna solve. Um, that would be willing to present those problems and let students work on them. So it's a little bit different model than being face-to-face -face and I'm in your workplace for maybe an eight-week period, but 
um, I'm able to be as a student presented with a problem and I can work on that and, and help solve it. Yeah. Um, so it's a great way for businesses to still um, provide those real world learning experiences, the applied learning opportunities that our students rely on and look forward to, um, but also maybe alleviating some of the stress that may come with um, in-person placements at a time when it's when they're not even fully staffed. Yeah, and that's right. And, and I was talking with some businesses last week because we've kind of put that menu of options out to them. And a lot of businesses, when, when they come to us looking, you know, they think they need mentorship, but maybe it's not mentorship they need. Maybe it's helping solve a problem. So I think, you know, last week we put out a notice to 52 small business owners. And I think 14 of them raised their hand and said, oh my gosh, I would love to have a student help with a with a problem, right? So and the more, you know, the more we get out, you know, and 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 ask businesses about that and tell them what it is that MBCC can offer them, it's it's kind of it's nice for them to have a menu of options for that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and a lot of students, as I say, rely on it. They, you know, they've come to us from wherever. Some were working before or some are fresh out of high school or they're changing careers or that sort of thing. But um, a lot of times they do come because they're entering a new area of work. And so those those placements and that experience is what helps them um, put experience on their resume, right? Because they may not, they may have a work history, but not in that particular area. So the applied learning components that experiential education is so important, not just to our learners, but then if I'm an employer and someone just graduated with their business administration marketing diploma, I also want to know what experience they have. And if they just graduated, my assumption may be they don't, but if they can show me in their portfolio some projects and some things that they've done for other employers, that will carry a lot more weight with me than someone that just completed the program without it. So it's it's so critical and our employers value it, our students do. And so if you're a business owner out there and want to get engaged with NBCC, we would love to partner with you. Yeah, absolutely. So the final, uh, you know, the final thing I want to ask you is, uh, you know, you you uh, have been an entrepreneur, like as you said, your whole adult life. Um, and as president of, of, of and CEO of, of NBCC, you, you certainly had your challenges. Um, what about, you know, your own business as an entrepreneur? Um, you know, did that see some challenges as well, um, you know, through through the pandemic? You know, it was very scary for us. Um, you know, as a, as a small business owner, you, you personally secure your business. And so if you lose your business, a lot of people don't know this, you lose your business, you lose sometimes your home and, and everything that you've worked hard for. So it was very scary. And, and our particular business is one that it didn't fit neatly in any of the categories that were listed. And so we like, are we allowed to be open? Are we not? And so, you know, we had to send staff, we have 15 staff and we had to send them home and say, we don't know, but we're committed to staying open and committed to providing you employment. Give us some time to figure it out. That was really hard to do. You have personal relationships when, when you're the one that's um, providing the employment and to send them home with, with an unknown was really difficult. And so my husband just, I went to work the next day to get this place going. He went to work and um, you know, slowly we started figuring out what we could do and couldn't do, what, what safety measures we had to put in place. Um, and we had to start very slow and one by one, we started bringing employees back. And, and that meant a lot to us because not everyone, um, you know, was eligible for the government programs that were available. We weren't as a small business. And, um, so we knew, we know our families, right? We know our employees and their, their spouses and their kids. And um, so it was really important to us um, that they were able to get back to work as soon as possible so that they could provide for their families. And um, we were able to do it. We're really excited. Um, we had a, um, a good start, but I'll tell you that supply chain is an issue. We're a retail store and, um, there are companies that that we're a dealer for that cannot get product because they can't get parts and things that they need. And we have a service department. We're unable to service um, some things because of a, a supply chain issues. And so I think, you know, we go about our lives and we're able to get groceries and, and we're minimizing movement. So we get our groceries and we go home and we're still largely staying very local and low key. So I, I think sometimes we're not as aware of the broader impacts of this, you know, 
food security we know is an issue. I know our food banks at NBCC have been accessed more than ever. Um, and, and we've heard about that in, in the news. Um, and that ability to have access to access to supplies and services has been impacted. And, and so it's going to further impact businesses um, if we if we can't make these course corrections. And, it, and it's really difficult because, you know, supply chain is a very complex thing in today's global economy. And so what happens in another country, we don't, we say, oh my gosh, look at those guys, they're locked down again. We have no idea the impact on the clothing we buy or the snowblower we need to run or our car or any of those things. So. Absolutely. Yeah. And like so many lessons have, I know we have lots of lessons to learn yet, but so many lessons have been learned. And, you know, I think that while, you know, it was, you know, some of our, you know, has had, had a negative impact in some things, it has a positive impact in other things because we're learning and we're listening and we're leaning into, you know, what can be done next and how we can change things moving forward. Um, I've really, really enjoyed this conversation, Mary. I could listen to you all day. And, oh, no. um, <laughs> um, but I know that your time is busy as well. So I appreciate so much you taking the time to chat with me today. And, Thank you for inviting uh, me. This was exciting. <laughs> and you know, you you uh, you're a big part of, of of why entrepreneurship is what it is at NBCC. So I thank you very much. Thank and you. I wish you a great day. And I wish the best to all of our business owners out there. Stay healthy, stay well, stay open. We need you to thrive as a province. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, Mary. Thanks.